Welcome everyone to Focus On. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. And I'm Mike Collins of Charlotte Talks in Charlotte. Hello to all of our listeners there on WFAE 90.7 FM. Today, UNC TV is partnering with WFAE to bring viewers and listeners alike an important conversation about a very timely topic, Confederate monuments. It's a subject that's anything but new, but has seen sustained coverage following the violent August 2017 incident in Charlottesville and our current political climate. So we have invited into this space voices representing different disciplines and interests to contribute to the ongoing dialogue. What you hear today may confirm what you already know or challenge your thinking. Either way, it's just important to talk. And listen. Mm -hmm. And to get things started, we want to share some things that we know about Confederate monuments here in North Carolina. According to state records, there are 120 Civil War monuments in the state. About eight out of 10 of them, 95 to be exact, honor the Confederacy. What we'd like to do is get started with a question about these monuments, and I'd like to direct this to Dr. William Sturkey. And Dr. Sturkey is an assistant professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We appreciate you being here today. Can you share with us a little bit about some of the misconceptions about these monuments? Sure, yeah. Um, I'd be happy to. I think the single biz biggest misconception is that they are strictly placed to remember Confederate soldiers. Um, we know a lot more about the organizations that placed the monuments when they did many of which were placed 30, 40, 50 years after the end of the war. And what they were was just one part of a project to promote white supremacy across North Carolina and across the former Confederacy throughout the South. And so we see the monuments that are still around today. That's just one part. Other things that organizations that promoted Confederate monuments did was to go into schools to offer new interpretations of the Civil War, promoting the morality of slavery, suggesting that African Americans should not be able to vote, suggesting that the 15th Amendment should not apply to African Americans living in the South, um, promoting the Ku Klux Klan in certain cases, for example, the Confederate monument that exists on my campus. The very next year, the United Daughters of the Confederacy published a book promoting the Ku Klux Klan for protecting white women by lynching black men. And so, the, one of the biggest myths is that it's just about the soldiers, and that's simply not true at all. It's about building and enhancing white supremacy, and we still see that reflected today so often in cases like Dylan Roof, where um, extraordinary white supremacists such as him go to the monuments because of that very same message that they were established um, to promote when they were built in the 1890s and in the early part of the 20th century. So many of these monuments have been up for over 100 years and we're just now beginning to have an extended conversation about what should happen to them. A lot of people want them to stay where they are. Other people want them to go into museums. And we have Brenda Tyndall with us, who is from the Levine Museum of the New South in Charlotte. And I'm just curious, Brenda, if you'll grab that microphone. Uh, I'm just curious about what kinds of conversations museums are having about where these artifacts should go. Well, museums are an extension of the historical enterprise, and ultimately what we're interested in and the kinds of conversations taking place in museums is that there needs to be more context around um, not simply um, the Confederacy and, and the symbolic gravitas of um, these monuments, but also the intentions um, behind why these monuments were actually constructed um, you know, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which also happened to coincide with the deepening um, racial segregation um, and the, um, the deepening of uh, Jim Crow in the American South. And so it's really important to draw those important um, connections, but more than anything, providing more context um, to understand why so many people, uh, not just in the South, but throughout the United States, respond um, in a variety of ways um, and draw different meanings from um, these monuments. Thank you, Brenda. And you know, you mentioned intention and context, and I'd like you to pass the mic backward a little bit to another member of our audience. Um, Frank Powell is a member of the North Carolina Sons of Confederate Veterans. Appreciate you being here as well. What can you share about context and intention as it regards these monuments? Well, first of all, thank, thanks a lot for having us here today. We appreciate the opportunity to share our viewpoint. Um, I think uh, Dr. Starkey, is that, is that correct? Uh, Sturkey. Sturkey, sorry, Dr. Sturkey, couldn't be more wrong. Uh, these uh, narrative going around today is just a revisionist history. These uh, monuments and statues were placed up mainly by ladies 
some of them took 10, 15, 20 years to gather the money together to place them. And almost all of them say, to our Confederate dead, just about all of them say that, which in fact makes them memorials and not monuments. They were memorials to men who answered the call of their state and marched off to war, many of them who did not come back. So that, in, in, in essence, also makes some grave markers uh, for these men that are laying in far off fields where nobody knows. So our position is, uh, no, they should be left as they, is, as they are and where they are because history is history, uh, like it or not, good or bad, history is history. Well, we actually will have a comment a little bit later that we pulled from uh, a dedication at one of these monuments, but um, we'd like to get some reflections, um, some, some more historical reflections, I think. And Dr. Timothy Tyson's with us. He's a best-selling <clears throat> author and historian, and he has roots here in North Carolina and a personal legacy of social justice and activism. And this is the, this is the argument right here. History, heritage, purpose. Why were they up? What do they stand for? How can we better understand the history and the heritage that people attach to these monuments? Well, nobody's more interested than me and historians in general uh, in preserving our history and remembering what, what the past was and then also about what it means to us now because what we how we interpret the past does change over time, even though the, the past itself doesn't change. How we interpret it does. I would say, uh, ask, to ask yourself, when do we put up monuments to things we just, put in the public square, to things we just want to remember, that, but that we no longer believe in or honor? To mistakes we have made. We don't put up monuments to that in the public square. We write books about that. There's, we do museum exhibits about that. But you won't see that happen very often. What we put in the public square is what we hold high and what we value and, and what reflects our common values. The, so uh, I think in that sense, uh, it's, a, it's a different thing as far as what we put in, a, what we remember and what we teach our children about uh, as best we can. That's a little bit different than what we put in the in the public square, um, where there's where where really that's just a way of saying we honor this, never forget this, and which is of course what they meant when they put up the statues. They honored secession, they honored the Confederacy, they honored uh, slavery and thought it had been they had been right. Uh, they honored states' rights and had a vision of of uh, of that that. Uh, most people no longer hold. So uh, I think Thank we should, you, those are the purposes. Um, I'd like to share a comment that we gathered from our Facebook page that kind of speaks to that. There's a woman from Wilmington who asks the question, what do different people see when they look at the monuments? Just because the major premise behind the war was wrong, does that lessen those who fought for what they believed at the time was a good cause? And I'd like to go back to, to you, Dr. Tyson, um, for, for your reflections on that, or actually could, could um, get a comment from, from Brenda, but help us, help us address that woman's statement, because a lot of people have said, you know, my ancestors fought for what they believed in, and should we not honor them? I don't think we should honor everyone who fought for everything. I don't think that we should honor white supremacy, even though that was a, a, one of our deep values for centuries. I don't think, uh, uh, you know, I had relatives on both sides in the Civil War, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, our, our, uh, we should never forget the past, but it's a different thing about, you know, the, when we place an, something as an emblem of honor, we put it, you know, the, in the center of town, coming down Main Street. Uh, that's a little bit different than a thoughtful approach to uh, looking at the, at the history, the way it happened, which I couldn't be more in favor of. I think that's so important that we have a, a real sense of history and not just a bumper sticker sense of history. I'd like to get a reflection from Mr. Powell on what's been shared so far. Um, um, have you heard any of these sentiments before, and, and what would your reflections be? 
Yes, I have heard these sentiments uh, before. Um, it's a very complicated issue, I think, on both sides because there's strong feelings on both sides, and I don't believe the sides have spoken to each other. And it probably would be good for the sides to speak to each other, but um, that doesn't change my position about the mo monument should stay as they are. Well, we have both sides here, uh, and and we're kind of speaking to each other <clears throat> today on this on this very topic. I think, uh, Doctor, uh, you wanted to chime in here. I could I could tell by your body language there. I think one of the key issues to recognize here is that new knowledge has been created basically since we've um, ended Jim Crow, right? People like me are allowed to work at universities, conduct research, enter archives, teach classes, whereas before 1964, my perspective would never be allowed. So what we had was generations of people, right, led by groups like the United Daughters of the Confederacy, who fall, who, uh, a racially segregated body, let's make sure that we include that, um, who sort of created this false narrative, right, in order to instruct an entire generation or two about a certain purpose behind the war. Now, what we have in the publishing world and the peer, peer review world is not highly contested by academics at all, right? It's only contested by individuals with a certain viewpoint that was developed for a certain set of purposes um, at the beginning of the 20th century, right? And then we have peer-reviewed academic research taught at universities. Thank you. I'd like to shift just a little bit now because we, there are laws in place now that help to protect some of these uh, monuments. There's actually policy support that protects monuments and others from being moved. In July of 2015, following the mass shooting at a black church in Charleston, South Carolina, and the removal of the flag from the South Carolina State House, North Carolina lawmakers successfully enacted a measure called the North Carolina Heritage Protection Act. And here is some of the language from that law. An object of remembrance located on public property may not be permanently removed. It goes on to say that they may only be re relocated to a museum or cemetery if they were previously there. And for this, I'd like to go over to Adam Lovelady. He's an urban planning and legal scholar with the UNC School of Government. Adam, can you share with us what is clear in this law and where is there room for interpretation? Sure. Um, so it's a, a combination of laws. There was already on the books a requirement that for state-owned statues, uh, moving or altering those would have to be approved by the State Historical Commission, and that was long on the books. This uh, new legislation passed in 2015. It's worth noting that it was introduced before the shooting in Charleston, uh, but then ultimately approved by the General Assembly after the shooting in Charleston. And it added this language, uh, which continues on to set up the the times when um, objects of remembrance, as that's defined, when they can be moved um, or uh, relocated, and when they can't. Uh, there's a general prohibition on completely removing statue or objects of remembrance, uh, but there is allowance for uh, temporary and permanent relocation if there's a construction project that's going to impact it, or if the state or local government believes that they need to protect the statue uh, by moving it. If it's a temporary relocation, it's for only 90 days after that project. Uh, but if it's a permanent relocation, then it has to go to a place uh, of similar prominence and access. And so one of the, one of the questions around the, the law is, well, what would be a place of similar prominence and access as compared to the Capitol grounds or the courthouse square? Good question. And Gary Pendleton was in the legislature when this law was passed between 2014 and 2016. And I'm just curious, as, from your point of view as somebody who was there, what's the intent of the law? What was the real intent, the heart of the matter? To preserve these monuments that mainly um, recognize the, vet, uh, the veterans. One thing I do want to point out that most people don't know, in 1959, Congress passed a law that Veterans of the Confederate States are deemed to be veterans of the United States and entitled to grave markers and that sort of thing. In fact, our organization went out to Oakwood to the Confederate section, and, uh, and I think we could get 12 a quarter from the Veterans Administration, and we, we had different volunteers, and we put up 1,100 of these U.S. government markers. And they say, Private John Pendleton, CSA. So they recognize it. So to me, to go deface 
something that honors a veteran, because they are U.S. veterans per, no, per U.S. law, is why don't they just go up to Arlington and spray paint the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? Same thing to me. And by the way, I'm a retired Brigadier General and served in the Army 26 years. So, you know, this is what we're looking at. I'd like to also, can I, can I say anything else? Please. I'd like to go to this gentleman over here from UNC. Rob Christensen, who's been with the News Observer 36 years, wrote a front page story about, what, a month ago? And he said that he's been all over the North, and he's, he's gone to all these different statues they have honoring their generals up North. And they were put up in the same two time frames as the ones in the South. And they commemorate either the anniversary of Gettysburg, 1863, or 1865. Same time frame, except the South had no money. So they had to save money because the South was completely bankrupt. So I feel very strong that our veterans ought to be honored, and I think anybody that defaces one of these monuments, sh uh, again, just go to Arlington with a can of spray paint. Thank you. We have a question for... Uh one of our audience members question is why celebrate symbols that are that are counter american some people would say that they're counter american well that's a question i actually had to bring up um the way i look at it more so is when you think about the study of signs and symbols you're thinking about how these signs and symbols represent the psyche and what you celebrate uh, if we very good example i grew up as a kid watching the show the dukes of hazard and mm -hmm. the general lee at the age of eight, I didn't know what the General Lee was, who he was. I saw a red car jumping over Roscoe P. Coltrane. But then, as I got older, for me personally, when I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee, the time I then saw the Confederate flag was when a student driving a pickup truck called, the, called me the N-word and spat on me. And when we talk about celebrating these signs and symbols of the Confederacy, that comes to my mind. So the question that I would raise to those of you who are in support of this is, why are we celebrating things, these signs and symbols, that in today's contemporary context are so anti-American? Thank you. Uh, the State Historical Commission is the commission responsible for all of these monuments and markers throughout the state. And Dr. Henry Watson is with us. Uh, he was on the commission for a while. And I'm, uh, I'd like to know... Harry Watson, excuse me. I'd like to know why, uh, while you were sitting on the commission, what the, what the commission work entailed, and what do you expect to come out of the meeting in April? They postponed this meeting until April to talk about what's going to go, happen to these monuments going forward. Well, to answer your second question first, uh, I think it uh, ought to be an occupational law for historians not to predict the future. Uh, <laughs> predicting the past is hard enough. Uh, the Historical Commission's work before we got famous was not as exciting as uh, the things they're dealing with right now. Uh, we have to, we did have to, I, I'm no longer on the Commission, uh, oversee things like historic sites, uh, historic parks, uh, museums, and so on. Uh, every time we had a meeting, there was a long list of new artifacts that had to be added to the museums, and we had to approve that. There was a long list of artifacts that uh, the museums did not want to keep any longer, and we had to uh, approve letting them go. Uh, there are historic preservation plans, historic neighborhoods, and so on that we uh, are asked to, to look at and have input on. So uh, it's a variety of responsibilities, um, but not very many hot button issues, except this one. So you're not going to make any predictions no. going forward. <laughs> okay, darn. We <laughs> were well, looking forward. Leaves the to conversation that. open. <laughs> leaves the options open. And you know, we've been talking. We've we've shared quite a bit in this short time. I'd like to get a, a question out to you, uh, Bree. Um, we have Bree Newsom in our audience, and you gained fame by scaling that capital in uh, South Carolina and removing that flag. What are your thoughts um, about um, the presence of Confederate monuments today? I know that how, how, we, how you feel about the flag, uh, 
but some people would distinguish between the flag and these monuments. Yes, well, I actually wouldn't distinguish between the two. I think the fundamental issue is really the ideology of white supremacy, um, how that is present in our culture, how that manifests as systemic racism, um, first beginning with the formation of the Confederacy and systemic racism as it existed in the form of chattel slavery, right? Um, the, conf the Confederacy was formed um, for the express purpose of maintaining that system, for keeping um, the majority of Southerners who were actually enslaved African Americans at that time in, in a state of perpetual bondage. That's why the Confederacy was formed and that's why the war was fought. So on one hand, we have to ask the question of why are we um, building monuments to that cause. We don't, for instance, um, erect monuments to Americans who decided to side with the British during the American Revolution. We don't have monuments to the Loyalists. We don't have monuments to Americans who sided with the Nazis during Germany because we would immediately view such monuments as morally abhorrent because of what they represent. But the issue of Confederate flags and monuments is an ongoing one because we have not resolved that issue of racism and systemic racism. The flag that I removed in South Carolina, for instance, was raised in 1961 during the height of in protest, really as a statement of opposition to the civil rights movement. And even as this gentleman mentions here in 1959, Congress deciding to um, make the determination that Confederate soldiers should be counted as United States veterans, even though they were fighting against the United States um, at that time. You have to remember, in 1959, black Americans had not secured the right to vote. I mean, even to the extent that we are still fighting for voting rights, securing voting, roads, fighting, voting rights, excuse me, in this state today. But in 1959, we certainly didn't have it. And so it's important to understand this whole period of time from the construction of the first monuments to it, the flag being lowered in, in 2015, you're talking about a, a period of time where we have racism encoded in the law and then held in place in many ways by terroristic violence by groups such as the Con Ku Klux Klan, which the Daughters of the Confederacy is honoring, by acts such as Dylan Roof going into a church and, and massacring non, not nine black parishioners while they were praying. It has to be understood that that's coming out of a long history of violent racial oppression. And if we're not discussing the, the issue of monuments and flags within that context, then we're doing ourselves a great intellectual disservice. Well, let's talk about history for a second, because we had a comment from Facebook uh, while, while we're going on here. And the comment reads, until all the latest commotion began, no one ever thought of these military tributes as racist. History is history. Removing statues won't change that. I know you just went on a long... Uh, speech there, but how, what, what, if anything, would you alter given that Facebook comment? Well, that's completely false. I mean, again, part of this conversation is about completely discounting the lives and experience and opinions of black Americans, not just during slavery, not just during the Reconstruction period, but even today. I mean, the fact that we had an incident, again, where nine people were murdered in a church, this is not coming out of nowhere. This is Dylan Roof, a young white supremacist. He's very much informed by the history. He he was informed by the history of, of Mother Emanuel. He's informed by the history of what the Confederate flag represents when he goes in there and commits that act. So the idea that this is something new, I mean, um, just with the flag in South Carolina, the NAACP had been leading a boycott of that for many years. The NCAA refused to host championship games there. This did not just suddenly become an issue. It's just that the, the tide of public opinion has finally reached a point. As Dr. Sturkey was mentioning, you finally have people of color in institutions and in places of power where uh, until like the past 50 years, we were not allowed entry and our opinions and our voices were not given any kind of space on it. But it's not a new controversy. You took it upon yourself several years years ago to climb that flagpole at Columbia at the State House grounds and take the Confederate flag down. And recently here in this area, we've had an instance in Durham where somebody toppled a, a Confederate uh, monument. Uh, and that raises all kinds of questions, particularly in light of the Heritage Act, that that's illegal criminal activity. Maya Little is a history student at UNC uh, Chapel Hill. She's been engaged with the protests at the Silent Sam uh, Memorial on that campus. What differences Maya, have you observed, if any, between the kind of protests you are involved in and what happened here in Durham? Um, so I would say, first of all, that uh, both the protests in Durham and our protests, we oppose Confederate monuments in our public spaces. Um, I would say that our protest has been peaceful and legal since the beginning. Um, we want to take this monument down peacefully, uh, legally. Um, and we want to also win hearts and minds. Uh, and we are in a unique position to do that as a university. Um, for one, as Dr. Sturkey already talked about, um, 
this, this monument doesn't stand to tell us anything about history, it stands to erase history. And as students of history and as teachers of history, it is important that we counter this um, Confederate history, which again rose out of Jim Crow, affirmed Jim Crow, um, and states things such as that black people enjoyed slavery and that they were educated by, uh, by, by their slave owners, uh, which is completely false based on the risk, uh, the risk of death black people took to escape slavery uh, during the, during the, uh, before the Civil War. Um, so, uh, as a university, on one stand, we, we, we serve to actually talk about history and tell, to tell a complex and a comp comprehensive history, which the statue does not tell right now, Silent Sam. Um, and on the other hand, we are in a unique place uh, as a university uh, with students um, to t discuss public safety. Uh, after Charlottesville, um, and I would say even before then, um, these statues uh, have become places where white supremacist groups have gathered and made their rallying points, violent white supremacist groups, um, which in Charlottesville caused the death of a woman who was counter-protesting peacefully. Um, uh, we don't want that kind of violence at our university. Uh, I don't think that we, and, and we have faced it, I will say, as a participant in the sit-in, um, we have had people come at us with death threats. We have had white supremacist groups um, act very aggressively towards us. Um, so again, uh, in the position we, sta we stand in as students at a university, uh, we oppose this statue uh, for reasons of public safety. And again, uh, because we are in a learning environment, and uh, in the process of learning, you tell a complex and comp comprehensive history, which the statue has never served to tell in its history at our university. You know, we're talking about protest right now, and, and currently there is a move on different campuses to try to put in legislation or policies on campuses that protects uh, the students and is, are enacted for safety measures. Um, I'd, I'd love to get your feedback and, and also um, yours about who these um, policies protect, whose free speech do these policies protect in your view? Um, as to the Board of Governors, um, kind of recent initiative to pass a law um, in our state uh, that would affect UNC and other campuses in North Carolina, um, which uh, says that, uh, which punishes students actually for free speech. Um, students can be expelled for expressing uh, their First Amendment rights in ways that have always been legal uh, up until uh, seemingly now when the Board of Governors has taken issue with it, uh, which is also interesting because it's coming along with this controversy uh, around Silent Sam. Um, as well, uh, these kinds of things make it so that uh, very vague laws uh, that do not accord with our First Amendment rights and do not accord with the kind of uh, notions we have about free speech, such as the fact that um, if a, if a uh, speaker or someone expressing uh, their First Amendment rights seems to kind of disturb university operations, uh, they can be punished legally uh, or expelled by the university. Um, I mean, that seems more like a way to counter um, and to suppress free speech rather than to develop conversations um, and protect students' First Amendment rights. And universities are in a unique position to do that. Um, that's what universities should do as learning environments, as places where students are taught to question um, and to ask questions. Um, these kinds of initiatives do not serve in any way to support freedom of speech. There's a different kind of initiative going on at NC State University, and we have a group of students from NC State with us. Matthew Champagne is here with Historians for a Better Future, and you've taken a different and more educational tact on this, Matthew. Tell us what your group does on that campus. Thank you very much for having us today. Um, so the students for Historians of for a Better Future, uh, we draw from historical material in order to address contemporary con uh, problems and concerns in our society. Uh, so by using this hi historical information uh, to construct conversations, uh, we hope that it results in a more just and inclusive future. Uh, this August, uh, as someone who was in Charlottesville, uh, the organization I'm a part of, we chose um, to structure conversations uh, around some of the Confederate monuments, specifically at Union Square in downtown Raleigh, considering we are a Raleigh-based organization, we decided to work within our community. And what we did is we created free history lessons. So that is what we hold, is we hold free history lessons. And these are all peer-reviewed? Yes, these are all okay. peer-reviewed scholarly works. Um, 
And we talk about the different histories in which these monuments were erected. We talk about the periods in which they were erected uh, during Reconstruction, during the Civil Rights Movement of the mid 20th century, and how they have a direct relationship to the legacy of white supremacy, which is not just revisionist historians writing in a later period, it's direct quotes from the speeches that uh, sons and daughters of Confederate generals gave at the dedications of these monuments, some of them on the anniversaries of when North Carolina went into the, or, or seceded from the Union and went into the Civil War as the 1895 obelisk is, um, or uh, was dedicated on that day. Um, Thank you, Matthew. We actually have a quote um, from an address that was given during the unveiling of a Confederate women's memorial at the state capitol. And it reads, quote, in short, as someone truly phrased it, the mistress was the greatest slave on the plantation, which moved at her command. In other ways, hundreds of Negroes displayed a noble fidelity that should always be remembered. How surely these facts will always establish the kindly relations that existed between the white families and the colored families on the plantation home, end quote. I would like to direct this next question to Melinda Lowry. She is an associate professor at uh, UNC, and she's director of the Center for the Study of the American South. Melinda, if we take down these emblems, what, what, does, what does that do to our remembrance and um, our holding on to certain history? Well, as others have said, history does not change. Our interpretation of it changes. And the question that we have to ask ourselves as local communities is which kinds of history do we choose to remember? Which kinds of monuments do we propose to put in places of honor? Uh, for me, as an educator, as someone who teaches American Indian history in North Carolina, I wonder why our heroes of American Indian communities are not honored in this state. Why we don't have monuments to their achievements why we don't have monuments to more achievements of the civil rights movement, why our sit-in markers, for example, around the state are so small in comparison to Silent Sam or the other Confederate monuments to Confederate soldiers um, that dot the state's landscape. Those are very hard questions to answer. I think the insights that have been provided today about when Confederate monuments were put up, why they were put up, and who put them up for what reason, uh, begin to, to address these really important questions about what we value. What we now have to do is recognize that while white supremacy has always infected North America since the arrival of Europeans in 1492, we can make a different decision as a society to honor all of us as equals and truly fulfill the promise that this country holds through its Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which doesn't just protect the existence of the monuments, it protects the speech and the opinions of all of us. You know, you, t you talk about how there's actually an absence of monuments to other um, references of, of history, the Native American, civil rights, et cetera. And one could say, well, groups are free and at liberty to raise the funds and rather than putting forth energy to protest the existence of, of one monument, raise another. I wish that were the case. That would be fantastic. <laughs> uh, having, Why can't they? Having been part of several efforts to raise monuments in Robeson County, North Carolina, to honor American Indian heroes in the Lumbee community, I can tell you it's not that easy. You have to go through the State Historical Commission, for example, there are lots and lots of rules and regulations uh, that prevent people from simply telling their own story. The, Dr. Sturkey and, and Ms. Newsom's point, though, about the presence of people like us in these public conversations is truly important. You know, it's only been in the last 30 or 40 years that people with a viewpoint that opposed white supremacy have really been allowed to speak in these kinds of forums. And it, if it took uh, European Americans several hundred years to mount the effort and raise the funds and secure the laws to, to promote 
a vision of white supremacy, then I believe that other people ought to be given at least the same amount of time. We have three historians sitting right here, and I'm just, social mores change over time. A hundred years from now, if they play this show back, this is going to look like an antique uh, for, many, <laughs> for many reasons, uh, not the least of which is our hairstyles. But, but how years. should we handle changing social mores and, and changing ideology when something was history? It's history. There it is. Should we just wipe it off the face of the earth? What do we do about it, Dr. Tyson? I think it's really important that things be understood in their historical context and that we not impose our views of things on the past. We have to understand the past as it happened, as it was. What does it mean to us? And, uh, but what happens is, is this commemoration process is fraught politically. For example, in North Carolina, in uh, 1894 and 1896, we elected an interracial government, uh, the fusion movement, as it was, it was called. They opposed the white supremacy campaigns. They opposed disfranchisement. They, it was very difficult in the 1890s to reach across color lines and talk about, and in the sh very shadow of slavery and the, and the crushing of Reconstruction, to reach across those lines and build a coalition. And it was far from perfect. But Look at what our children and what our grandchildren are going to be facing as citizens and the kind of social order that they will be trying to construct. What lesson does the Confederacy have for them? What lesson does the fusion movement have for them? I think it's very plain that the fusion movement has a, has a more, uh, is a more compelling and important thing to teach our children about, and yet it doesn't show up in the textbooks, and there's no monument to them anywhere in North Carolina. There are five Confederate monuments on the State House grounds. There's so much history to be shared, and there's a certain history that's been taught so far, and then there needs to be a move uh, for, for rewriting how that history is shared and also who's narrating it and, and, and the power of, of that voice behind, behind the story. We actually have another question I want to take from our audience. Um, and this is a journalist, Sierra Hinton. Sierra, do you have a question? Um, yeah, so um, my question, um, you know, some of you have already touched on this a little bit, uh, but many of the Confederate mon monuments that exist um, exist in public spaces and on public land. Um, and, you know, what duty does this state have uh, to all citizens to ensure a fair and equitable existence? Um, and, you know, when do we put that existence before heritage and history? That's a good question. Thank you so much. Who would like to handle that? Mr. Watson? Um, Can we get a... I think we need to get a microphone to you. Okay. There we go. Well, the law is very clear right now. All of us have a right to exist, and that law absolutely has to be enforced to the letter for everybody. Uh, and insofar as these monuments um, encourage violence or threats or um, mistreatment of any of us, that's another uh, strong reason why they need to come down. So uh, I, I think this conversation is extremely valuable because it's forcing a lot of people who hadn't thought about it very carefully um, to say, okay, what would a monument like that look to me if I was in somebody else's shoes or somebody else's skin? And that's a terribly important question. And if, oh, if this conversation helps more people raise that question for themselves, then I think it will be uh, an enormously uh, positive contribution. And this gets back to something I think Frank Powell said earlier in this conversation with the Sons of Confederate Veterans. And I've talked, I've talked to a lot of members of the Sons of the Confederate Veterans over the years. And they are absolutely sincere in their beliefs that these monuments uh, are all about history and heritage and the honoring of ancestors. They're absolutely, to the bottom of their souls, uh, they believe that. Yes. But what do you say to people who are really viscerally offended by what these stand for and, and, what, and the time in our history when black people were nothing more than chattel? 
Well, first of all, I'd like to say a point I wanted to make earlier in the conversation was on the other side of the room that it's a real danger and you touched on it too. It's a real danger to judge people that lived 100 or 150 years ago by today's standards. Um, in 1860, every white person, north and south, was a white supremacist by today's standards. So I don't think you can really use that as a, as a judge. But, 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 but if you have these statues standing in 2017 on public grounds, t funded by taxpayers, and I'm a black person, and I have to walk past this statue every single day to get to work or to whatever I have to go, to class, whatever. And I'm offended by that. Why, why should they be allowed to stay? Why should my tax dollars fund, fund that? And I'll interject, it's not just black people who are offended. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, to start, That's true. <laughs> to start with, um, the Sons of Confederate Veterans paid the money to have the statues cleaned the last time they were cleaned. So no tax money is, is going to those statues um, at this time period. And if they need cleaning again in the future, we'll step up and and give the money to have them clean and up, upkeep if anything uh, needs to be repaired. We stand ready to do that, not only on the state capital grounds, but anywhere okay, in the but state. That doesn't, but that doesn't... But, yeah, but I that, just wanted to make that clear because okay. you were talking about taxpayer money when no taxpayer money is being used. But somebody who is offended, I'd just like to have a serious conversation with them and explain our viewpoint. Do you, feel like you've been do, do you feel like you haven't been heard in oh, all yes, of these definitely, conversations? Definitely, yes, yes, definitely. Uh, we have not been heard, uh, and there's so much false narrative out there. A lot of people are told something, and they take it as gospel. They never research, and they never check any further, and they keep telling it over and over again until it becomes true can when it really is. Can you give an example of that? This white supremacy nonsense. The statues do, and monuments and memorials do not represent white supremacy at all. Dr. Sturkey, you want to jump in there? Yeah, so just a couple of things. So one of the things that we see often during the dedication speeches to the monuments is the emphasis that the monuments represent white supremacy. So we have all sorts of documents, speeches, transcripts. Um, I'm happy to share any of those. Many of those are available online through the Wilson Library, where the dedicators quite specifically said this is in defense of white supremacy and the Anglo-Saxon race. We can prove that up and down all day, every day. The other thing, too, is that it's not quite true that the Sons of Confederate Veterans help pay to maintain the monuments. The University of North Carolina has spent over $40,000 in the last three years in order to help do so. I'm sure that the town of Chapel Hill would love to send a bill to the Sons of Confederate Veterans for the police presence required um, in August to help protect the monument at that point in time in which there was also a helicopter involved during that point in time. There are police probably stationed there right now. So it is absolutely taxpayer dollars going to protect these monuments and I would welcome any group who wants them to come to Chapel Hill, take Silent Sam, put it on your front yard, celebrate it every day, I don't care, protect it yourself, pay for it yourself. I would welcome that intervention anytime they want it, they can come have it. Thank you, Dr. Sturkey. Um, we have a question. Um, uh, you go ahead with that, that and I then we'll to, take I your comment. Two things that were wrong, and I want to clarify. All right. Well, let's go ahead and clarify it now. Okay. One of them talked about the uh, basically insinuated the United Daughters of Confederacy and Sons of Confederate Veterans were racist. Um, there are black women in the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Yes, there are. There are black men and sons of the Confederate veterans. If you go to Monroe, North Carolina, there's a big monument in front of the courthouse to 10 black Confederate soldiers that fought for the Confederate states. Yes, con blacks fought for the Confederacy. Well, when I'm through, you can, you can, you, you, and you'll have your turn. Um, but, you know, it, it, to say that the war was fought for slavery, only 6% of Confederate military owned slaves. I had two great-great-grandfathers. But the first paragraph of every single article of Confederation in every state that seceded from the Union specifically says that the reason for the secession is slavery. That's so. But so it was look a, at the, so look at the individual slavery. soldiers that we're honoring. 6% of them owned slaves. My two great-great-grandfathers were private in, privates in the Confederate Army. One was killed in combat, one wasn't. 
they sure weren't slaveholders. In fact, they were very, 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 very poor. My whole family was from the mountains of Virginia. But it's not really a conversation about the soldiers and whether or not they owned slaves. It's about the war and the purpose of the war, um, we're which honoring, was over No, slavery. we're honoring these soldiers. We're not honoring the Confederate States. Thank you. Yes, so <clears throat> first of all, the war absolutely was fought over slavery. That was the issue. Simply because you have a black person who was in a Confederate uniform doesn't change the meaning of the war. And, and yes, the, the majority of people in the South were not slave owners. That's not... Uh, that doesn't discount the reality of white supremacy as an ideology. The reason why the white people who were in the South were not enslaved and the black people were was it was a built on a racist belief that African Americans should stay in a state of bondage. That was made very clear by quotes from the president of the Confederacy, by the vice president of the Confederacy, who said that the cornerstone, the vice president of the Confederacy said that the cornerstone of the Confederacy rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man and that slavery is his natural place in the world. That's essentially what he said. So this, again, the, the debate over monuments is really a deeper debate over ideology. It's a debate over slavery, over whether or not we feel that slavery was truly wrong. And it's a debate over modern racism as it exists today. The fact that many of these monuments were placed at on courthouses and on public property was a statement about the order of power in the South at that time. And, and continuing today, that's why we, why we have this ongoing debate. Yes, the letter of the law says that we have equal protection under the law, but the reason that we had a civil war, the reason that we had a civil rights movement, the reason that we're continuing to debate this is because that's not true in practice. And until we are truly believe that everyone in this country should have equal rights and should have equal say, then we are still living out the legacy of white supremacy. The debate over monuments is just one part of that. But we can't, we can't continue to talk about monuments and flags as though they exist separate from this ongoing legacy of racism and racial terror in this country. Can, Thank I, you, Brie and can I bring yeah, uh, yes. uh, uh, Brenda Tindall back into this conversation? Brenda's with the Levine Museum of the New South. And, uh, we, did, we don't, we really, in Charlotte, we really Really haven't had a lot of discussion about this. We've had our eyes focused on other issues that maybe could stem from the Civil War because we're talking about uh, in, in economic uh, in, uh, inequity, etc., in Charlotte and, and the, the things that have built up f from that. A lot of people would say that these statues are reminders of our history. What if they stayed up? Why couldn't we use them as a jumping off uh, point to talk about? what those statues mean, what that time in our history meant, and how it relates to today and where we are today in race relations. Well, I think that they are, they, they are jumping off points. I mean, Charlottesville in particular is but an exemplar of that. Um, it sort of also is suggestive of the ways in which racism is opportunistic and how uh, monuments become sites for espousing um, uh, racist ideologies. And so in some ways, you know, I, I don't think that it necessarily has to um, happen in Charlotte um, for it not to be um, a part of the American experience right now, right? Like, I mean, I think Charlottesville in particular is um, just a contemporary example of the ways in which monuments have um, uh, Confederate monuments in particular um, have been um, sites of, um, you know, unrest um, and for espousing ideas um, that uh, of white supremacy. Um, and so even if the intention um, isn't, um, you know, to uh, to espouse those ideas, the fact that folks endow those monuments with that kind of meaning is really suggestive of um, how problematic um, these monuments are and how they become sites of, of white supremacist ideology. And I know there's a lot of thought going around in the room right now. We have one from Virginia Bridges, who is with the Durham Herald Sun. Uh, Virginia, do you have a microphone? Great. Virginia. Thank you. So if state leaders did allow these Confederate monuments to be moved, what should the process look like that will determine where they will go? It's a good question. If they were to be moved, what would what would be the process? Any suggestions? It's a good question, though. Well, I think part of the process should be that it needs to be a, a deliberation among community members writ large and not sort of top down in the ways in which those decisions are made. 
Um, and so I think that's one of the first steps is to make sure that there is a need, uh, a uh, democratization of the ways in which we um, delegate and talk about and deliberate about uh, monuments writ large. Thank you. I'd like to go back over to Maya. She has a, a comment that she wanted to make. Yeah, I guess we can. I'd like to answer that question. Yes, um, please. In regards, especially to Silent Sam uh, at UNC. Um, for one, there's a question of whether Silent Sam is truly even legally uh, legal on campus, as it was not ever approved by the NC Historical Commission. And these kinds of objects of remembrance and statues have to be approved by uh, the NC Historical Commission to be placed on uh, public grounds, which is a public university. The other thing is I would like to say to Mr. Powell, who's uh, from the Sons of Confederate Veterans, uh, the, United Daughter of, uh, the United Daughters of the Confederacy uh, groups in Missouri and Florida have taken the initiative after, after Charlottesville to reclaim these monuments um, in order to both distance themselves from white supremacist groups um, such as the ones at Charlottesville who rallied around these monuments, who also claim these monuments, um, and perpetuate violence in their name. So I do think that that is another legal option. Um, if groups such as the Sons of Confederate Veterans and the United Daughters of the Confederacy would speak out um, and claim their, own, they claim their own identity, because right now there are white supremacist groups and groups who uh, wish to violently suppress minorities who also claim these statues. And again, that, those groups have already taken the initiative in places like Florida and Missouri. And that is, uh, seems to be uh, a process that uh, um, both uh, the students of the Silent Sam sit-in have reached out to the United Daughters of the Confederacy to initiate. So um, speaking of the legality of removing these monuments, that I think is one option. Have events like what happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, hurt your cause, the Sons of the Confederate Veterans? No, not at all. We have. Uh for years, we've denounced white supremacy, racism, and the Klan. You can look on our national website and our latest uh, uh, motion that was passed at our general convention uh, against the Klan is on there. If but wouldn't like you have people walking through the streets with lit tiki torches screaming white power? Well, doesn't that hurt you? Well, it, it probably hurts us more than it hurts the black community because they're talking, they're misrepresenting our ancestors, they're misrepresenting our flags because those flags belong to us and they don't belong to them. And the compromise here seems to be to take these statues down but put them in a museum where they are part of our history and they stay part of our history. Some of our most cherished objects are in museums around the world. Would that be, an, would that be objectionable to you? Yes, sir. Uh, you cannot compromise your heritage. If you compromise your heritage, you have nothing. So. And I don't trust museums. We've had other instances we've put things in museums and they mysteriously disappear never to be seen again. So, no, sir, that's not an option for us. I think it's interesting that you bring up the, um, the fact that there are African Americans who are members of um, Confederate veterans uh, societies, daughters of Confederate veterans. Indeed, there are because there were African Americans who served as Confederates. There's more information, however, to be known about what capacity they served, what role they served, and many of them were serving alongside uh, a master. So th there's, there's always more to the story when we go into deeper layers. And I think it's interesting, we did try to get um, an African American uh, locally who is a member of the uh, Daughters of the Confederacy, and she told us that she was not allowed to speak. Okay, let me answer that. For some reason, Frank could answer it better, but for some reason, the daughters of the, I'm sorry, United Daughters of the Confederacy have chosen to remain silent on this issue. Why? I don't know. And Frank doesn't know either. Hmm. Interesting. Well, well, they're not here to represent themselves. Dr. Tyson, let's, 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 get, a, let's, let's get a microphone, get a microphone, microphone to over first. to you. Otherwise, no one will hear you. <laughs> the myth that there were, uh, African-American soldiers in the Confederacy rests upon this, which is that uh, now the, the, the uh, slaveholders with, with huge plantations were exempt from going, but uh, many slaveholders who went to the war took with them their body servant, right, an enslaved uh, black man. The years afterward, the uh, widows of the servants filed a, a petition to the government to get a Confederate pension because the pension, the national government was uh, paying those. So um, 
that's where that's what the people are citing when they say there were con African American Confederate soldiers. Good point. And it is time for us to wrap up. Yes. <laughs> it has been a great conversation. Yes. Mike, thank you so much for coming out and, and helping to keep the conversation going and bringing it to the WFAE listeners. Well, it was a great pleasure for all of us at FAE to be involved in this. So, something new for me, but an important topic, I think, to collaborate on with, uh, collaborate on with UNCTV. Thank you, Mike. And if you would like to revisit this conversation, we will have it available online at unctv.org. Thanks so much for joining us. For Focus On, I'm Deborah Holt-Noel. And I'm Mike Collins. Keep listening. Have a good day.